Welcome to the next episode of our NCLEX review series. In this episode, we're going to dive deep into the essential topics of obstetrics and gynecology, which the NCLEX board frequently tests you on. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button as we have over 100 more videos planned to assist you in acing your NCLEX exam. The gestation period. The gestation period, often referred to as pregnancy, marks the remarkable journey from the fertilization of the ovum to the eagerly anticipated due date. This period typically encompasses around 280 days, but it is essential to recognize that it can vary significantly among individuals. One method employed to estimate the due date is Nagel's rule. To apply this rule, a woman should have a regular 28-day menstrual cycle. Nagel's rule involves subtracting three months and adding seven days to the first day of the last menstrual period, with an additional year added if necessary. Alternatively, one can add seven days to the last menstrual period and count forward nine months. Gravidity and Parity Gravidity and parity are terms that provide insight into a woman's reproductive history. Gravidity pertains to the number of pregnancies a woman has experienced, including her current one. A pregnant woman is referred to as a gravida. A noli gravida is a woman who has never been pregnant, while a primi gravida is embarking on her first pregnancy journey, and a multi gravida has been pregnant at least once before. Parity, on the other hand, quantifies the number of live births a woman has had after reaching a gestational age of at least 20 weeks, regardless of whether the infant was born alive or not. A noli para has not given birth beyond 20 weeks of gestation. A primi para has experienced one such birth, and a multi para has experienced two or more pregnancies that reach the stage of fetal viability. To encapsulate this information, healthcare professionals often use the GTPAL acronym. G represents gravidity, the total number of pregnancies. T stands for term births, babies born after 36 weeks of gestation. P refers to preterm births, babies born before 37 weeks of gestation. A indicates abortions or miscarriages, counted in gravida if before 20 weeks of gestation and in parity if past 20 weeks of gestation. L signifies the number of currently living children. Recognizing Pregnancy Signs Pregnancy is a transformative phase marked by a myriad of signs and symptoms characterized as presumptive, probable, and positive signs. Presumptive signs are subjective indicators experienced by the mother, including amenorrhea, nausea, vomiting, breast changes, urinary frequency, quickening, the first perception of fetal movement, fatigue, and alterations in vaginal mucosa color. Probable signs are objective findings that can be observed by a healthcare provider, such as uterine enlargement, Hager's sign, softening of the lower uterine segment, Goodall's sign, softening of the cervix, Chadwick's sign, violet colorization of mucous membranes, Belotment, fetal rebound on palpitation, Braxton Hicks contractions, and a positive pregnancy test that detects human chorionic gonadotropin. Positive signs are diagnostic and confirm the presence of pregnancy. These signs include detecting the fetal heartbeat using electronic devices, like a Doppler transducer at 10 to 12 weeks, or a non-electronic fetoscope at 20 weeks, feeling active fetal movements, and visualizing the fetus through radiography or ultrasonography. Fundal height. Measuring fundal height is a valuable technique for evaluating the gestational age of the fetus during pregnancy. In the second and third trimesters, weeks 18 to 30, the fundal height in centimeters approximately corresponds to the fetal age in weeks minus 2 centimeters. For instance, at 20 weeks of pregnancy, the fundus should be positioned near the level of the umbilicus. At 16 weeks, the fundus is typically located midway between the symphysis pubis and the umbilicus, while at 36 weeks, it should reach the xiphoid process. It is crucial to exercise caution during fundal height assessments, particularly when the client is in the supine position, as it can lead to supine hypotension. 
the physiological transformation of the maternal body. Pregnancy instigates a profound array of physiological changes within a woman's body, subject to variation among individuals and influenced by cultural factors. Here are key physiological alterations that transpire. In the cardiovascular system, pregnancy induces several adjustments. Circulating blood volume increases, encompassing elevation in both plasma and total red blood cell volume. This shift can result in physiological anemia as plasma increase surpasses red blood cell production. Consequently, iron requirements escalate during pregnancy. Furthermore, the heart enlarges and shifts slightly upward and to the left due to the expanding uterus. Additionally, sodium and water retention may occur as part of these cardiovascular adaptations. Turning to the respiratory system, pregnancy brings about notable changes. Oxygen consumption rises by approximately 15 to 20 percent. The enlarging uterus exerts pressure on the diaphragm, pushing it upward, potentially causing shortness of breath in some women. Pulse rate may also increase by 10 to 15 beats per minute, while blood pressure undergoes a slight decrease in the second trimester before rising in the third trimester. Respiratory rate, however, mostly remains stable or slightly increases. In the gastrointestinal system, pregnant women experience distinct alterizations. Nausea and vomiting are common in early pregnancy due to the secretion of human chorionic gonadotropin, although these symptoms typically subside by the third month. Decreased gastric motility may lead to reduced appetite. Pregnant individuals often report shifts in taste and smell perception. Furthermore, constipation can be a common issue, possibly due to increased progesterone production or pressure from the expanding uterus, causing decreased gastrointestinal motility. Physiologically, the gastrointestinal system undergoes alterations, sometimes leading to uncomfortable symptoms like flatulence, heartburn, and excessive saliva secretion, patilism. These changes are primarily driven by fluctuations in gastrointestinal motility, stomach emptying, and rising estrogen levels. Additionally, increased venous pressure may result in the development of hemorrhoids and gum tissue may swell and bleed. The renal system is not immune to these shifts. Frequent urination becomes noticeable in both the first and third trimesters, often accompanied by reduced bladder tone due to heightened progesterone and estrogen levels. Furthermore, the renal threshold for glucose may decrease during pregnancy. Hormonal changes play a pivotal role throughout pregnancy. The basal metabolic rate increases, and various endocrine glands adapt to support the developing fetus. Notably, the anterior lobe of the pituitary gland enlarges to produce prolactin for lactation, while the posterior lobe generates oxytocin for uterine contractions. The thyroid experiences slight enlargement and heightened activity, and parathyroid glands also grow. These hormonal shifts contribute to weight gain and water retention. In the reproductive system, significant transformations occur to accommodate the growing fetus. The uterus undergoes hyperplasia and hypertrophy, while the cervix becomes shorter, more elastic, and larger in diameter. Ovaries adjust by inhibiting ovum production and secreting progesterone. Vaginal changes include hypertrophy, muscle thickening, and increased secretions. Breasts enlarge, become tender, and exhibit darker areoli with superficial veins becoming more prominent. Montgomery's follicles may hypertrophy, occasionally leading to colostrum leakage. Pregnancy also has visible effects on the skin. Elevated melanocyte-stimulating hormone results in increased pigmentation, including the appearance of the linea nigra on the abdomen. Colasma, often referred to as the mask of pregnancy, may develop on the face. Reddish-purple stretch marks, known as stria gravidarum, may emerge on various body parts. Vascular spider nevi might appear, and hair growth may accelerate. Musculoskeletal changes are evident as well. Hormones like relaxin and progesterone affect posture and the lumbrosacral curve, potentially leading to aches, numbness, and weakness. Pelvic joints become more mobile, and the abdominal wall stretches, causing a loss of tone. Beyond the physical, pregnancy triggers psychological shifts. Early on, ambivalence is common, characterized by conflicting feelings of dependence and independence, as well as uncertainty about role changes. Partners may also experience ambivalence regarding their new roles and financial responsibilities. 
Acceptance of pregnancy varies, influenced by readiness, identification with motherhood, the partner relationship, the bond with the unborn infant, and birth preparation. Emotional ability, marked by frequent emotional fluctuations, is a common but not necessarily abnormal occurrence during pregnancy. Body image changes, driven by physical transformations and accompanying symptoms, can influence a woman's self-perception. The relationship with the growing fetus evolves from acknowledging pregnancy to nurturing the developing baby, encompassing preparations for birth and parenthood. Pregnancy often brings discomforts, like nausea and vomiting in the first trimester, driven by hormonal changes and alterations in carbohydrate metabolism. Managing these discomforts may involve strategies, such as consuming dry crackers and avoiding immediate toothbrushing upon waking. Managing Nausea and Vomiting First on our list is the challenge of dealing with nausea and vomiting, particularly prevalent during the initial trimester of pregnancy. These symptoms are primarily driven by hormonal fluctuations and an increase in blood volume. To find relief, expecting mothers are encouraged to adopt some practical tactics, opting for small, frequent, low-fat meals throughout the day, sipping fluids between meals rather than during, avoiding fried and spicy foods, Considering acupuncture, consultation with a healthcare provider might be necessary for certain methods, discussing herbal remedies with their healthcare provider, HCP, and when appropriate, taking prescribed antiemetic medications. Addressing syncope. Moving on to syncope, a condition that can surface in the first trimester but may become more frequent in the second and third trimesters. Hormonal shifts, increased blood volume, Anemia, fatigue, sudden position changes, or lying flat on your back can trigger syncope. To prevent fainting episodes, pregnant individuals should take specific precautions. This includes sitting with their feet elevated, being cautious about falls, making slow position changes, and avoiding the supine, lying flat on your back, position, especially in later trimesters to prevent supine hypotension due to pressure on the inferior vena cava. Dealing with urinary urgency and frequency. Urinary urgency and frequency are common discomforts, typically experienced in the first and third trimesters due to the pressure exerted on the bladder by the growing uterus. Managing these symptoms involves practical interventions. Expectant mothers are advised to stay hydrated by drinking at least 2,000 milliliters of fluids during the day, reduce fluid intake in the evening, empty the bladder regularly, sleep on their side at night, Use perineal pads as needed and perform Kegel exercises to strengthen pelvic floor muscles. Alleviating Breast Tenderness Now, let's address breast tenderness, which can arise in any trimester due to elevated estrogen and progesterone levels. To alleviate this discomfort, pregnant individuals are encouraged to wear a supportive bra and avoid using soap on the nipples and areola area to prevent skin dryness. Managing Increased Vaginal Discharge Increased vaginal discharge is a common occurrence throughout pregnancy, driven by changes in vaginal mucosa and increased mucus production. Managing this discomfort involves practicing proper cleansing and hygiene techniques, wearing breathable cotton underwear, avoiding douching, and properly consulting with the healthcare provider, HCP, if an infection is suspected. Coping with Nasal Stuffiness Nasal Stuffiness which can occur in any trimester due to increased estrogen levels, can lead to nasal tissue swelling and dryness. To alleviate this, individuals are advised to use a humidifier and consult their HCP before using nasal sprays or antihistamines. Tackling Fatigue Now, let's address fatigue, a common issue in the first and third trimesters, often related to hormonal changes. To combat fatigue, it is recommended to schedule regular rest periods throughout the day, maintain correct posture and body mechanics, engage in moderate exercise, perform relaxation and muscle strengthening exercises, and avoid stimulants found in foods and drinks throughout pregnancy. Relieving Heartburn Heartburn is a discomfort that typically occurs in the second and third trimesters due to increased progesterone levels, decreased gastrointestinal motility, esophageal reflux, and uterine enlargement. To alleviate heartburn, individuals should opt for small, frequent meals, sit upright for 30 minutes after eating, drink milk between meals, avoid fatty and spicy foods, and consult with their HCP about suitable antacids. Managing Ankle Edema 
Ankle edema, or swelling of the ankles, is common in the second and third trimesters due to factors like vasodilation, venous stasis, and increased venous pressure below the uterus. To manage this, it is advisable to elevate the legs at least twice daily, sleep on your side, wear supportive stockings or support hose, and avoid extended periods of sitting or standing. Addressing Varicose Veins Varicose veins, which typically appear in the second and third trimester, are often caused by weakened vein walls or valves and venous congestion. Effective interventions include wearing supportive stockings or support hose, elevating the feet when sitting, lying with the feet and hips elevated, avoiding prolonged periods of standing or sitting, moving around to improve circulation while standing, refraining from leg crossing, avoiding constricting clothing like knee-high stockings, learning leg exercises, and minimizing prolonged airline travel. Managing Headaches Headaches are generally considered benign in the first trimester, but may require further investigation if they occur in the second and third trimesters. They can result from changes in blood volume and vascular tone. To manage headaches, individuals should change positions slowly, apply a cool cloth to the forehead, have a small snack, and use acetaminophen only if prescribed by the HCP. Alleviating Hemorrhoids Hemorrhoids are common in the second and third trimesters due to increased venous pressure and constipation. To alleviate discomfort, it is recommended to soak in a warm sits bath, sit on a soft pillow, consume high-fiber foods, increase exercise such as walking, and use ointments, suppositories, or compresses as prescribed by the HCP. Addressing Constipation Constipation often occurs in the second and third trimesters due to hormonal changes, decreased intestinal motility, and pressure from the growing uterus. To address this issue, individuals should consume high-fiber foods like whole grains, fruits, and vegetables, drink at least 2,000 milliliters of fluids daily, engage in regular exercise such as a 20-minute walk, and consult with your HCP for stool softeners, laxatives, or enemas if needed. Managing Backache Backache is common in the second and third trimesters due to an enlarged uterus, causing an exaggerated lumbosacral curve. To alleviate back pain and reduce the risk of falls, it is recommended to take regular rest breaks, maintain correct posture and body mechanics. In our comprehensive exploration of maternal risk factors, let's delve into the multifaceted aspects that can exert an influence on perinatal outcomes. One pivotal determinant is maternal age, and it wields a substantial impact on these outcomes. Elevated risks are associated with both youthful mothers under the age of 20 and more mature mothers over 35 years of age. When considering adolescent pregnancy, a myriad of factors converge to contribute to its occurrence. These encompass early menarche, shifts in sexual behaviors, familial discord, economic hardships, and limited reproductive and contraceptive knowledge. Regrettably, adolescent pregnancies bring forth a spectrum of formidable challenges, including insufficient nutritional intake, emotional and behavioral complexities, paucity of support systems, escalated risks of stillbirth, low birth weight infants, fetal mortality, cephalopelvic disproportion, and augmented maternal complications such as hypertension, anemia, prolonged labor, and infections. As healthcare providers, our pivotal role in mitigating the risks and consequences of adolescent pregnancy cannot be overstated. We must ardently advocate for prompt and continuous prenatal care, while judiciously referring adolescents to the requisite support systems when circumstances necessitate it, particularly in ameliorating the adverse effects of unfavorable socioeconomic conditions. Nutrition emerges as a foundational pillar of a healthy pregnancy. Adequate nutritional sustenance is indispensable for the unimpeded growth and development of the fetus, with distinct dietary requirements evolving throughout various stages of pregnancy. It is incumbent upon us to recommend folic acid supplements to women of childbearing age to preempt neural tube defects and oral facial clefts in the developing fetus. Genetic considerations loom large in this context. Genetic assessments facilitate the identification of inheritable risk factors for congenital anomalies. Timely prenatal care, which encompasses dental health, assumes paramount importance in curtailing the risk of preterm birth and low birth weight. 
Regrettably, some adolescents may find themselves ensnared in situations of abuse and violence, which can invariably escalate the risk of complications such as abruptio placentae, preterm birth, and infections stemming from unwanted or coerced sexual encounters. Thus, it is incumbent upon us to approach these issues with the utmost sensitivity and offer appropriate support and interventions. Medical conditions such as diabetes mellitus, hypertensive disorders, or cardiac ailments can amplify the risks associated with pregnancy, underscoring the imperative for vigilant monitoring and adept management. Turning our attention to other risk factors, maternal infection with German measles, rubella, within the first eight weeks of gestation pose the highest risk of fetal infection. Sexually transmitted infections carry significant implications during pregnancy as well. Syphilis, for example, can traverse the placental barrier, culminating in spontaneous abortions and an escalated risk of mental impairment and physical deformities. Condyloma cuminatum, human papillomavirus, can be transmitted during vaginal childbirth, fostering the development of epithelial tumors in the mucous membranes of the larynx in infants. Gonorrhea has the potential to infect the neonate at birth, giving rise to complications such as ophthalmia neonatorum, pneumonia, and sepsis. Chlamydial infection, when transmitted during vaginal delivery, can precipitate neonatal conjunctivitis, pneumonitis, premature rupture of membranes, premature labor, and postpartum endometritis. Trichomonas has been associated with premature rupture of membranes and postpartum endometritis. Genital herpes simplex virus, characterized by painful lesions, can entail grave consequences, accentuating the need for judicial assessment and management during pregnancy. Transmission of the human immunodeficiency virus, HIV, can transpire through various routes, including exposure during childbirth and breastfeeding. Preventive measures may encompass the perinatal administration of zidovudine. Substance abuse during pregnancy poses a substantial risk to fetal growth and development, potentially leading to fetal growth restriction, abruptio placentae, and fetal brachycardia. It is imperative to eschew teratogenic substances and over-the-counter medications without the approval of a healthcare provider. Finally, viral hepatitis. With further details available in Chapter 26 and Chapter 52 for Hepatitis B is an additional cause for concern. Now let us pivot our focus to antepartum diagnostic testing. Throughout pregnancy, healthcare visits typically adhere to a schedule of every 4 weeks up to 28 to 32 weeks, every 2 weeks from 32 to 36 weeks, and weekly from 36 to 40 weeks. Crucially, blood type and RH factor testing are indispensable in discerning blood compatibility and ascertaining the necessity for Rho D immune globulin Rogam, in RH negative clients. Rubella titer testing assumes pivotal importance. Clients exhibiting negative rubella titers should receive the requisite immunization postpartum with a concerted emphasis on birth control and avoiding contact with immunocompromised individuals. The monitoring of hemoglobin and hematocrit levels stands as an imperative during pregnancy as any decline may signal the onset of anemia. Furthermore, a Papaniklaus smear is conducted during the initial prenatal examination to screen for cervical neoplasia. Collectively, these factors and tests occupy an indispensable role in safeguarding the health and well-being of both the expectant mother and the burgeoning fetus during the intricate journey of pregnancy. Now we will explore a range of prenatal screening tests and procedures aimed at safeguarding the health and well-being of both the expectant mother and the developing fetus. Screening for Sexually Transmitted Infections STIs. This assessment is indispensable for gauging the client's risk and determining the need for further evaluation and treatment based on the outcomes. Sickle Cell Disease Screening Moving on to sickle cell disease screening, this is typically recommended for clients at risk. A positive test result might trigger the requirement for additional screening and follow-up, ensuring timely intervention and appropriate care. Tuberculin Skin Test Following childbirth, healthcare providers may opt for the tuberculin skin test. A positive result on this skin test suggests the necessity of a chest radiograph. However, it's important to note that pregnant clients should only undergo radiography after reaching 20 weeks of gestation, when fetal organs are fully developed. Those who convert to a positive result may be referred for postpartum medication-based treatment. Hepatitis B Surface Antigen Testing 
Hepatitis B antigen testing is advisable for all pregnant women due to the prevalence of the disease in the general population. In specific cases such as healthcare workers, intravenous drug users, and individuals with particular risk factors, hepatitis B vaccination may be recommended. It's noteworthy that hepatitis B vaccination is not contraindicted during pregnancy and may be suggested by the healthcare provider for at-risk individuals. Urinalysis and Urine Culture Next, we come to urinalysis and urine culture, which constitute an essential component of antipartum visits. During each visit, a urine specimen is collected for glucose and protein assessments. Glycosuria, which is often observed during pregnancy, may arise due to a lowered renal threshold. However, persistent glycosuria may be indicative of diabetes. Additionally, the presence of white blood cells in urine points to infection, while ketonuria can result from inadequate food intake or vomiting. Importantly, protein levels of 2 plus to 4 plus in urine may suggest infection or preeclampsia, necessitating further evaluation and management. Ultrasonography Ultrasonography assumes a critical role in visualizing and identifying fetal and maternal structures. It assists in confirming gestational age estimating the due date, and evaluating amniotic fluid volume through specialized measurements. Ultrasonography can be conducted abdominally or transvaginally during pregnancy. For abdominal ultrasounds, clients may be advised to consume water to fill the bladder, enhancing visualization. Transvaginal ultrasound entails the insertion of a lubricated probe into the vagina. Importantly, this procedure is not associated with any known risks to either the client or the fetus. Biophysical Profile The biophysical profile is a non-invasive evaluation of fetal well-being, encompassing assessments of fetal breathing movements, movements, tone, amniotic fluid index, and fetal heart rate patterns through a non-stress test. Normal fetal biophysical activities indicate proper central nervous system function and adequate oxygenation, providing valuable insights into fetal well-being. Doppler Blood Flow Analysis Doppler Blood Flow Analysis is a non-invasive ultrasound technique used to study blood flow in the fetus and placenta, facilitating the assessment of fetal circulation and health. Percutaneous Umbilical Blood Sampling PUBS PUBS is carried out when fetal blood sampling becomes necessary. This procedure involves the insertion of a needle into the fetal umbilical vessel under ultrasound guidance. Fetal heart rate monitoring is required for one hour post-procedure, with a subsequent ultrasound to check for bleeding or hematoma formation. Rh-negative women may receive Rho D immune globulin due to the increased risk of Rh sensitization. Alpha Fetoprotein Screening Alpha fetoprotein screening involves the assessment of fetal serum protein levels. Abnormal levels can indicate open neural tube and abdominal wall defects, as well as help screen for spina bifida and Down syndrome. In the event of abnormal levels, repeat testing is advised, as false positives can occur. This screening entails a maternal blood sample taken between 16 and 18 weeks of gestation, followed by further evaluation and ultrasound examination for elevated levels. Deoxyribonucleic Acid DNA Genetic Testing DNA genetic testing is employed to identify abnormalities related to inherited conditions and to determine the risk of having a fetus with specific genetic disorders. This testing can be conducted as early as seven weeks of gestation using a blood sample, offering valuable information to inform decision-making. Chorionic Villus Sampling CVS CVS is performed to detect genetic abnormalities by aspirating a small sample of chorionic villus tissue between 10 and 13 weeks of gestation. This procedure necessitates informed consent and may involve bladder filling for visualization, if performed before 20 weeks. It also entails monitoring vial signs and fetal heart rate. Rh-negative women may receive Rho D immune globulin due to the increased risk of Rh sensitization. Amniocentesis Amniocentesis entails the aspiration of amniotic fluid and is ideally conducted between 15 and 20 weeks of pregnancy. This procedure aids in the detection of genetic disorders, metabolic defects, and the assessment of fetal lung maturity. While amniocentesis is a valuable diagnostic tool, it carries potential risks such as maternal hemorrhage, infection, Rh isoimmunization, abruptio placentae, amniotic fluid emboli, and premature rupture of the membranes. 
Prior to amniocentesis, clients provide informed consent. Bladder status is considered. Ultrasonography aids in locating the placenta, and continuous monitoring of vital signs and fetal heart rate is implemented. Kick counts, fetal movement counting. Lastly, we have kick counts, a simple yet crucial practice. Clients are instructed to sit quietly or lie down on their side to count fetal kicks. Clients should promptly inform the healthcare provider if there are fewer than 10 kicks in two consecutive two-hour periods, or as instructed by the provider, as this could indicate potential issues warranting further evaluation and monitoring. The Fern Test It serves as a microscopic slide examination to detect amniotic fluid leakage. This entails collecting a specimen from the cervix and vaginal pool, subsequently examining it under a microscope to identify a fern-like pattern, indicative of amniotic fluid presence. During this procedure, it is crucial to position the client in the dorsal lithotomy position and instruct her to cough, as this may induce amniotic fluid leakage if the membranes are ruptured. Now, let's delve into the nitrazine test, utilized to identify amniotic fluid in vaginal secretions. Vaginal secretions typically have a pH ranging from 4.5 to 5.5, which does not affect the test strip or swab. However, amniotic fluid with a pH ranging from 7.0 to 7.5 will cause the test strip or swab to turn blue. To conduct this test, position the client in the dorsal lithotomy position. Apply the test tape to the fluid and observe it for a blue to green, blue to gray, or deep blue color change indicating the presence of ruptured membranes and amniotic fluid leakage. Lastly, let's discuss the fibronectin test, which involves collecting cervical and vaginal secretions to detect fetal fibronectin, a protein found during specific gestational periods. Positive results may suggest the onset of labor in one to three weeks, while negative results are more predictive of the absence of preterm labor. This test is typically employed when there is a risk of preterm labor. To perform the fibronectin test, place the client in a lithotomy position for a sterile speculum examination. Obtain cervical secretions using a cotton swab and send the samples to the laboratory for fibronectin presence analysis. Now let's move on to some guidelines regarding nutrition during pregnancy. Expectant mothers should aim for an expected weight gain of 25 to 35 pounds for those with a normal pregnancy weight. An additional 300 calories per day are needed during pregnancy, with calorie needs increasing in the later trimesters compared to the first. During lactation, an extra 500 calories per day are required. Folic acid supplements are essential for all women of childbearing age to prevent neural tube defects and oral facial clefts in the fetus. Adequate hydration is also vital, with the goal of consuming at least 8 to 10 8-ounce glasses of fluid daily, including 4 to 6 glasses of water. Sodium intake is not restricted unless prescribed by the healthcare provider. For individuals following vegan and vegetarian diets, it is crucial to ensure a varied diet to meet normal nutrient and energy requirements. Clients should be educated about consuming complementary proteins throughout the day to provide all essential amino acids. Potential deficiencies in these diets include energy, protein, vitamin B12, zinc, iron, calcium, omega-3 fatty acids, and vitamin D if limited sunlight exposure. Increasing protein consumption with a variety of vegetable protein sources, enhancing iron absorption by pairing it with vitamin D-rich foods, and including a variety of plant-based foods are recommended. Lactose intolerance can lead to digestive discomfort, and clients with this condition should incorporate non-dairy calcium sources into their diets. Cooked forms of milk, such as custards or fermented dairy products, may be tolerated, along with cheese and yogurt. Lactase supplements can be prescribed, and lactase-treated milk or lactose-free products are commercially available. Lastly, we discussed PICA, a condition involving the consumption of non-food substances. This cause is unclear, but cultural beliefs may play a role. PICA can result in iron deficiency anemia, so addressing this behavior is important. Now, let's delve into the non-stress test, NST, and contraction stress test, CST. The non-stress test evaluates the function and oxygenation of the placenta and assesses fetal well-being by examining the fetal heart rate, FHR response to fetal movement. 
To perform this test, an external ultrasound transducer and tachodynamiter are applied to the client to record a tracing lasting at least 20 minutes. This allows observation of both the FHR and uterine activity. Baseline blood pressure is measured, and blood pressure is monitored frequently. The client is positioned in the lateral, side-lying position to prevent vena cava compression. Additionally, the client may be instructed to press a button whenever she feels fetal movement, and the monitor records these movements as reference points for assessing the FHR response. Results for the non-stress test can be categorized as reactive, indicating a healthy fetus, non-reactive, abnormal, or unsatisfactory when the tracing quality is insufficient for interpretation. Moving on to the contraction stress test, it is performed to assess placental oxygenation and function, evaluate the fetus's ability to tolerate labor, and assess fetal well-being. During this test, the fetus is exposed to contractions to evaluate placental perfusion under simulated labor conditions. It is typically performed when the non-stress test yields abnormal results. To perform the contraction stress test, an external phenol monitor is applied to the client and a baseline strip of 20 to 30 minutes is recorded. Uterine contractions are induced, either through oxytocin administration or nipple stimulation, until three palpable contractions with a duration of 40 seconds or more in a 10-minute period are achieved. Frequent maternal blood pressure readings are taken and monitoring occurs while oxytocin doses are increased. Now, before we proceed to the next part of this topic, there is a contest in which you can win $1,000 or enroll for free in our online course. Simply participate by answering contest questions asked throughout this video. Contest question 1. Which gland is referred to as the master gland of the human body? Contest question 2. Which hormone stimulates milk production? Contest question 3. Which vitamin deficiency leads to night blindness? Please write your answers in the comment box below. Good luck.